Thank you guys all for having me. Uh, it's very exciting to be here on the cusp of what is uh, an amazing opportunity here in Oregon uh, to really change the world and um, have, a, have a truly positive impact on mental health and um, outcomes. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about myself and my firm, as well as what we've done in these regulated, stigmatized spaces. Um, I started my career in venture capital working for a firm named Highland Capital, and it was in the depths of the recession. And so we were investors in a lot of interesting companies, um, specifically in the consumer space, one called Lululemon. And um, I uh, found, a, found an investment in a um, company that was an e-cigarette brand, and our uh, um, GC, our general counsel, told me, you can't do that. We can't do that. We have a vice clause. And so I uh, said, well, what's a vice clause? And um, from there, realized that there were a lot of things that, um, for various reasons, rational and some irrational, didn't fit in a traditional venture capital portfolio. And so when I started my own firm a couple years later, um, I had the idea of basically having no vice clauses. And so we became early investors in a company that went on to become Juul. Um, we were early investors in um, Compass Pathways, a tie. Um, we were early investors in companies in, this, um, in the cannabis space, like uh, LeafLink, Ease, Pax, and um, really believed that through investing for-profit capital, when these companies in these spaces were not in favor and they were not something that was attracting money from traditional institutional investors that we could have, you know, above market returns and that we could help, you know, kind of change the outcome of these industries by bringing, um, by bringing capital to really talented founders that were trying to build a company and um, trying to build an industry, frankly, because it was, it was very early days. And so that's been our mission now. We've invested in over 50 companies, um, about 12 in the lower harm nicotine space, um, about 20 um, plus in cannabis. And um, in psychedelics, we just invested in our 14th um, opportunity. And so we in the psychedelic space have, have you know, uh, been early backers going back to 2017. But um, I've been a donor to MAPS and other kind of not-for-profit causes going back to 2010. Um, I was one of the first people involved in the Capstone cam campaign for MAPS, uh, which helped raise $75 million, um, and um, believe that uh, for-profit and not-for-profit um, companies and endeavors can interact and, and work together in, in really magical ways. And so um, I'm really excited about what's happening here in Oregon. Um, I just you know, want to take one second and talk about my personal experience. Uh, with psychedelics. In, in 2015, I had my first ayahuasca experience to help me through some really challenging kind of uh, traumatic experiences growing up and um, have since then um, worked almost quarterly with a psychedelic therapist and guide and so found it to be some of the most kind of helpful experiences of my life. And as somebody once said, I mean, it's a uh, it's a hundred hours of therapy in in one one session. So um, I think uh, it, it's really really exciting to be here, and it's exciting all the work that's being done in Oregon to help bring this um, treatment to many many more people. So thank you. Thanks for sharing your story, James. Our next speaker on the panel is Les Zabo. Les is Director of Constructive Capital at Dr. Bronner's, the top-selling natural brand of soap in North America. He joined Dr. Bronner's in 2013. Under his leadership, Dr. Bronner's Constructive Capital Department anchors the company's impact investing and philanthropy, philanthropy programs, including the distribution of a minimum of one-third of profits annually to support charitable and activist causes. Welcome, Les. Hey, everyone. 
So uh, thank you to Horizons uh, for giving us this opportunity to talk a little bit about Dr. Bronner's giving program and, um, and, and how we operate. Uh, my, my name is Les Sabo, uh, Director of Constructive Capital. And um, as mentioned, our department oversees most of the company's uh, philanthropic and impact investing activities. And in, in terms of like our work and what we do, our, our mandate is really to find the right match, the right type of capital uh, for the right uh, type of organization. And we have, we classify things in terms of four types of capital. The first, obviously, the, the financial support, and that comes in the form of, of grants, of uh, impact loans, and uh, occasionally uh, equity investments. And uh, we actually have two of the panelists that are our, our grantees, uh, Fireside representing uh, uh, a grant, and then uh, inner track uh, representing uh, impact loan. And but but it's not just the the financial support um, or, or financial capital. It's also three other types of capital, non-financial. Uh, one is is uh, product donations. So we've really just recently upped the product donation support to uh, many of our partners. Uh, they it, we gave away a lot of chocolate this year. And it's, uh, it's used by the nonprofits to help with fundraising, let's say a crowdfunding campaign, or uh, gifts for their staff or their volunteers, or um, I, I think there's, or, or events. <laughs> and I think there's supposed to be chocolate here, or at some point there's gonna be chocolate available. Um, and, then, and then the third type is, is really about, uh, is, is providing uh, marketing and media firepower uh, for these issues and these these campaigns and these orgs, and so we have a a, a pretty sizable uh, community that through our our social media platforms and through our our newsletter and whenever there's an opportunity to raise the profile of one of the orgs or raise the awareness around an issue, uh, we rely on that that platform and it's it's pretty powerful. And then uh, fourth, it's it's about capacity building. And in some cases, mo most of the orgs that we support are uh, very early stage or even startup. And and the needs there's there's always capital needs, but in some cases there's also uh, the need for capacity building. And so we do trainings, we do webinars on all different uh, sort of functions and, and areas that that uh, support nonprofit development. And so it could be a, a it could be a session on fundraising strategy. It could be a session on creating a social media campaign. And so we do that in sort of larger group settings, but then we also do one-on-one uh, -on -one advisory work as well. And we have a whole staff of uh, just within Bronner's that is there and available to support our, our partners. And then occasionally we bring in uh, outside advisors as well. And then just a little bit about the, the, the model itself. So we, we just did this analysis uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I, I know the, the number one third was mentioned before about the percent of profits that we, we give away. Um, but we just did this review of the last six years and it's actually two thirds of our profits that are, are donated to our giving budget. <laughs> And, and, and to our activism. And, and there's really, there, there's two reasons we can do that. One is because uh, we don't have uh, any sort of sh shareholder payouts. So all of the profits of the company are either used to reinvest back into the business to grow the business, or they're used for um, the issue areas that, that, that we care about. And then the second reason is that we have a cap on uh, salaries so that the highest paid uh, employees of the company, uh, including the officers, can't make more than five times what the lowest paid employee, vested employee can make. And so, <laughs> so you can imagine there's, there's a nice pool of funds there to, to, to support these issues. And, and we, have, we have 10 issue areas that we cover. Drug policy reform is the, 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 the largest 
So this year, our giving budget was $9 million, and, and a little over half of that amount uh, went to drug policy reform. And uh, we, we classify within that drug policy reform budget, um, there's psychedelics and, and there's cannabis. And then, and then we also, there's three kind of primary domains that we organize the giving under. Uh, the first is the traditional 501c3 giving. Uh, the second is the political advocacy, so that's, that's primarily uh, through a 501c4 vehicle. And then the third is the impact investing. And the impact investing is relatively new. It's only a couple, couple years old. Um, and it's, it's just, it's, it's really an extension of our philanthropy. So um, there's very, uh, the, the, the legal form uh, is sort of secondary. The, 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 the financial return is, is, is secondary. It's really about um, kind of impact first. And so there is not as much attention paid to the expected return. And in most cases, it's not even the point. Um, but we could talk more about that in the, the Q&A. So thank you. Thank you, Les. Our next panelist we have today is Hanifa Nayo Washington. Hanifa is a social entrepreneur, cultural producer, and healing justice practitioner with 20 years in nonprofit leadership. Hanifa works at the intersection of mindfulness, placemaking, and social justice to create organizations, gatherings, spaces, and experiences rooted in the values of beloved community. As the co-founder and the chief of strategy for Fireside Project, Hanifa supports the design, facilitation, and communication of Fireside Project's mission, vision, initiatives, and strategic partnerships. Welcome, Hanifa. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we doing today? Beautiful. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here today to be part of this conversation and so um, glad in my heart that uh, the conference has come to, to Portland. It's really awesome that the first year that I moved to Portland, um, that Horizons decided to also bring the magic to the West Coast, so thank you so much. Um, so I am the co-founder and the chief of strategy at Fireside Project. We emerged out of the pandemic. Um, in 2020, we came together to hover around this concept, this idea of what does it mean to democratize access to emotional support, quality emotional support during and after psychedelic experiences. Understanding that as the psychedelic renaissance in the US was exploding, that many people may be left behind, that many people may not have access. Um, so how do, we dis how do we come together to make sure all folks have access, all folks are educated, particularly in these times in their life that might be one of the most significant and impactful experiences they may ever have. We hold this work as sacred, and we, we come together as peer supporters, peer support, people to people, the psychedelic peer support line that we launched last April has now served over 5,000 people. 5,000 souls have called this line. <laughs> They're reaching out to us during psychedelic experiences. They're reaching out to us after those experiences to process, to integrate, to connect. And we would be nothing, nothing without our volunteers. And I just wanted, just for a second, if there are any volunteers, Fireside volunteers in the room, please stand up. We want to give you some love. Thank you so much. Yes. We have trained 200 volunteers um, over the course of the year and a half that we've been operating. And we have such a grand vision in store. And we could not do that without the support of those who are funding really important um, organizations and companies within the psychedelic space. We see ourselves as a safety net. We touch all aspects of the psychedelic field. So anybody who is actively tripping, those who are trip 
sitting and holding space for others, those who are processing, um, can call this number, 62 Fireside. It's free and it's available to all folks. We also believe that it is important to change the face of the psychedelic field to ensure that all people see themselves here. Know that this medicine and, the, and safe practices afterwards to integrate and to understand and, um, and explore the meaning of what happened in your, during your experience is available and possible. So we kicked off an equity initiative earlier this year in February to ensure that our volunteer pool is representing those folks who may have been decentered um, and marginalized along the way because of the war on drugs and because of the very nature of intersecting um, systems of oppression that are very much real in this country. So we want to undo those things. We want to make space as for as many people as possible. So we have brought on initial 40 volunteers who are folks coming from the BIPOC communities, military veterans, and the transgender community to be a part of the community of peer support volunteers, to also welcome those callers who might share that identity, an opportunity to speak with someone from their community to process with, because we know representation matters. It creates safety and vulnerability, a space for safe vulnerability. We also know that we need to be educated and we have to have strong connections within the field to make it. It's all about who you know. And so we have worked with um, collaborators and partners like Naropa University, CIIS, MAPS PVC, Fluence, and others to be able to provide full scholarships to our affinity volunteers as they complete their year of service so that they can uh, make their own path into the psychedelic space um, so that they can be the researchers and the facilitators and the cultivators. Um, and we know that as they grow and settle within the space, more folks from those communities will feel like they belong. And that really is our true vision, is to be able to create a beloved psychedelic community. Um, and so, I, where's the time? Okay. And so um, I'm really honored to be part of this conversation today and looking forward to share more of my story. Thank you. Thanks for your comments, Hanifa. Our last panelist tonight is uh, no stranger to us. You heard from him in his opening remarks. It's Tom Eckert. Tom was the architect of Oregon's Measure 109, and with his late wife, Cherie, helped guide the campaign to establish Oregon's statewide psilocybin services program. Tom served as chair of Oregon's governor-appointed psilocybin advisory board during its pivotal first year. He founded the Oregon Psilocybin Society in 2015, and more recently established InterTrek, an Oregon-focused psilocybin facilitator training program, as well as the Cherie Eckert Foundation, which supports equitable access to psilocybin training and services across the state of Oregon through scholarships and supportive programs. Welcome back to the stage, Tom. All right, thanks everybody. Yeah, I don't wanna to say too much. You're gonna be seeing quite a bit of me this weekend. Um, but yeah, as one of the originators of Measure 109, um, one of the things we are, we said a lot during the campaign and we meant was that we wanted to advance a, uh, we call it community-based uh, approach to psilocybin services. And so now that we're in this kind of infrastructure building uh, phase, the question arises, you know, what does that really mean? What does it mean community-based? How do things really grow organically and retain the spirit of the communities that they they arise from. And so I think a lot of that has to do with how things are funded, how uh, projects are identified, and how that funding works. Uh, it's a huge piece, and I'm excited to join the discussion uh, with the panel and all of you on that, on that topic. Yeah, so after Measure 109 passed, I spearheaded a couple of projects that have found some funding to get launched, so I'm super, super thankful. Uh, and quick shout out to Nate Howard, who helped me uh, get these programs off the ground. Right on, Nate. Yeah. 
Yeah, the Sri Eckert Foundation, which is a, a scholarship fund uh, supporting equitable access to both facilitator training and psilocybin services when they come online in 2023. Um, yeah, so we are looking to raise funds. We're actively raising funds for, for scholarships, first for training programs, but the idea there is that we need a diverse practitioner base that really represents the diversity of communities here in Oregon, and we need to create opportunity for folks that uh, you know might not otherwise be able to afford a, a training program. A training programs are can be a little bit costly. So we are working hard from that angle, and the, as I said earlier this morning, there's other angles. There's uh, uh, ways to, to support equitable access through policy, working on the insurance coverage side of things when we get into services. So it's an ongoing dialogue, but the Sheree Eckert Foundation is, is focused on, on that piece. I'm also working on InterTrek, the uh, facilitator training program. Um, yeah, the idea there is to graduate license-ready practitioners to open up this, this statewide program. Um, yeah, I guess that's about all I'll say, other than, importantly, that both of those projects are supported by Dr. Bronner's, and so was the campaign. The campaign was hugely supported by Dr. Bronner's. So, yeah, there's, there's, not, there's just not enough gratitude I could express for, for, for Dr. Bronner's, David and Les and, every, and the Bronner family. Uh, we wouldn't be here having this kind of discussion if it wasn't for them. And they're doing it right. So I'm looking forward to uh, communicating that to you and being part of this discussion on uh, fundraising and philanthropy. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your story, Tom. Thanks to all the panelists. Um, on that note of, of funding, um, I was curious, Hanifa, um, for, for the Fireside Project, um, how was that funded? What, what was your budget and, and how long did acquiring those funds take? Sure, thank you. Um, so Fireside Project emerged, really we started planning and organizing in the summer of 2020 um, with very little funds, just the funds that the founder and co-founders co were bringing to the table our time, um, uh, and also, you know, want to deeply thank Bronner's for re being the first um, to come forward to support us um, and to lift us up and to giving us our first seed, seed funding so that we could progress in the space. Um, I've started a lot of different um, community serving projects and nonprofits, and there's a real insidious nature in, in the nonprofit realm in terms of philanthropists, there's this, we'll give you a little bit of money and see if you make it next year, and if, that, if you're around, then maybe we'll give you some more. I think that that model is really dangerous, um, and it, it's, it can really hurt a lot of small nonprofits that are coming up, who are coming to the work from a place of service and not from a place of wanting to, um, to make money, right, to, 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 to do that. And so, I think that being able to have that support from Browners was a signal to other funders in the space to say, hey, this is also um, a worthy uh, cause to be behind. And we really thank Browners um, for that support and for welcoming us into the circle. And so there were many other individuals um, who stepped up to support us. So most of our funding has come from private donations uh, from philanthropists within the space. We are technically a a uh, fiscal, fiscally sponsored project um, of the Social Good Fund, and we actually just applied for, um, for our 501 just last week, so we put the, finally put the paperwork through, um, which also allows us, once you have that, to apply for different types of grants, federal grants, which is some of the, the funding that we're trying to go after um, to have, um, because we are a national line, we support folks all over the country. Um, and so originally, we were really just trying to cover our expenses for the technical uh, pieces of the work in terms of the technology, the phone line, and all of that. Um, started off with you know, three or four people really doing the coordinating and the work. And now, after a year and a half of fundraising and hitting the ground, um, you know, meeting people, going to conferences, saying we're out here, sending proposals, um, we were able to, to raise 
1.5 for our first two years, um, and we have a lot, a lot to go because we have the idea to expand. You know, we had, we reached our goal of 2,500 calls in our first year, um, and we hope to, you know, triple that, you know, in our second year and beyond. We really want to be reaching, you know, 50,000, 60,000 people a year, um, and to do that, you know, we have to continue to raise our awareness. Um, and so, it's a tricky place to be as a, literally like a startup and a nonprofit, um, because you have all these different things at play, including like your values, your, the time that you have, and also who, the, the people who know you. And so being able to create real relationships um, has also been super important and a really big part of the success of um, where, what I think is successful, where Fireside is at now. Great, thank you. And one more question before we um, get to a question for all the panelists. James, you mentioned um, an impressive list of companies that you or your company have invested in. Um, I was curious about what is interesting for investors in Oregon, and why do you think investors should be looking at companies in Oregon? So, thank you. Um, I think that the interesting thing in looking at Oregon is that this can be a test case for companies that are national or international, like Synthesis, or it can be an opportunity for homegrown companies to really kind of make their mark on a pretty much kind of the second market for, you know, um, psychedelics, first being nationally, ketamine being an opportunity. But this, this feels like um, a really advantageous time to start, and I think that, you know, the the opportunity here is just you've got a willing and working with you government from a regulatory standpoint. Um, you have folks on the ground like Tom that have helped put this together. That um, there's a there's a community aspect to it that actually reminds me a lot of early days of cannabis. Um, and the, the the other thing is really if you're if you're starting something here, um, I think the first question you want to ask yourself or if you're if you're coming here is you know what are my goals are, are my goals to um, become a big company and sell um, because that's that's what you kind of take on for the most part when you take traditional venture capital funding mm -hmm. is that you are signing a deal that says in three five seven ten years I'm gonna sell this whole thing either to the public for you know um, for, for public shares and public, you know, have, have liquid trading public equity, or you're making a deal that you're gonna sell this company to a pharma company or another company in, in and around this space, healthcare or health insurance. And so I think that um, in, it, when, when I look at what might be an interesting model for a lot of the businesses that will, you know, be started and, and thrive here, um, I think that some of them might be a good fit for venture capital, but I think a lot should look very seriously into um, different forms of debt, uh, revenue share financing. I think that there are opportunities around, um, you know, a lot of different um, kind of more innovative um, kind of fundraising structures. Because, um, like I said, when you take you know equity venture capital, you are in rare cases getting an investor that is not. Uh, that, is, that is looking for a long-term profit-sharing kind of uh, motive or that is looking for, you know, uh, you not to at some point in time have a realization. And so we, we are very lucky in that um, when we see companies that um, we, we look out as, you know, they're not going to be rocket ships. They're going to be much more like what I would call bullet trains where you kind of build up to speed and you, you know, have a different focus than, you know, an ultimate liquidity event. Um, we, we tend to fund those as single purpose vehicles. And so that, that's a really interesting thing that happens more frequently today, but you really want to kind of look your investor in the eyes and be like, so what do you expect here? Yeah. Because um, I, I think that uh, venture capital is right for a lot of different um, types of companies and um, it may be right for some um, in Oregon, but I think that you should think seriously about whether revenue based financing or, um, or sorry, revenue share financing or, or or a different type of debt structure might be a good fit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, James. You are touching on uh, one of the most upvoted questions yeah. from the audience. So um, I'll 
raise this to all the panelists. What is the best advice for a new entrepreneur seeking investment in this space? And I think if you could be um, specific about like starting points, that might be helpful for the audience. Mm. If you want me to go again? <laughs> um, <laughs> so my, my first piece of advice would be, if you're looking to raise money, I would go to the people that you know and that you trust around you. They could be your friends, your family, they could be, you know, people that you respect in business, and I would pitch your idea. I would get their honest feedback, and I would try to get some of them to invest. Uh, I mean, you don't want to take money from somebody that can't afford to lose it, but um, I always like to come into a situation where the company has raised money from people that they care about because it's a lot more um, serious kind of pressure and community around you. Um, be, you know, when you've raised money from your mother. Um, I like to say that <laughs> that can be a very awkward Thanksgiving dinner, but, but you kind of learn something from it when you, you know, take somebody's trust in you and their capital. Um, and so I'd first go to your friends and family and I would get their feedback. Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, the other piece of advice that I would have is I would exhaust all forms of grants or other ways that you can get somewhat non-dilutive financing, which in this space might be a reality. Um, and then lastly, I, I mean, I would ask your friends in your network for introductions to folks that are on the capital side. Um, and if, and I would also, I would cold outreach folks. I think um, that's an underappreciated uh, kind of method of fundraising. Um, I think probably I'd, I'd, I'd respond to like, you know, call it one out of 10, but um, I think that every once in a while somebody reaches out and says, I've got a great idea and we're, we're you know, interested in it and so um, I think that I, I think ultimately though I would I would go and I would pitch your idea around to your friends and family first and I would get their as unvarnished feedback as possible I suppose I could comment um, yeah, I've always seen Oregon as kind of the counterpoint or counter narrative to some of the stuff we see happening in the world around psychedelics the kind of VC-driven rapid scaling. Uh, so I would say, you know, and this is just kind of where my heart is with Oregon, is just kind of resist the lure of scaling up mm. super quickly, especially in Oregon, because we need to grow organically. We're figuring this out as we go. And so when I say community-based, it's like, I like where James is headed with this, finding financing that is based on relationships, where you, there's trust and there's community around the investment as well as the work because that's how we grow together. And, and that's how we create not only good companies, but good networks of companies in Oregon that, know, that are working together for the common mission of a successful rollout. Um, so, you know, don't, it, it, it's exciting to, you know, it, psychedelics is kind of a, a, a attention grabber and you may come across VC that gets excited and wants to throw money at you, but it's not necessarily a good thing to have a lot of money thrown at you. You know, it feels like a good problem to have. Um, but, you know, people ask me a lot, like, what does a successful rollout look like? Uh, I'm not sure I have all the nuances to that, that answer, but I don't think it's about necessarily meeting all the demand at once. I think that's unrealistic. I think that we have to grow into this together. And so financing that kind of matches that mentality makes sense to me. I think that's what we found together is like, what are we really trying to do? What steps can we take and when to, to advance this program such that it's um, not meeting the entire demand, but meeting the kind of different check boxes that create kind of an equitable start. So the seeds are in place to grow into a full ecosystem that's meeting lot, all the different demands, all the different community needs out there over time. And that's not to minimize that there aren't people, people need help now, I totally get it. You know, there's, there is an urgency around getting on the ground and having a successful rollout. But, you know, just kind of moderation in our thinking about how we, how we scale this up. And I think that has a lot to do with the, the financial relationships and the investment relationships. Yeah, and <coughs> I'll, I'll just, Am I? Can you hear me? I think if you keep speaking, they'll turn you up. Hello? Can you hear me? 
There it oh, is. There, there we go. So, so yeah, I, I think um, our, our rubric is maybe different from uh, a more traditional VC in that uh, we are, well, well, first, everything comes down to intent and, and the people for us. So this is, in, in most cases, the proposals that we get are from people that are, that are activists in one way or another and have a passion to, to solve a certain problem. And, and, um, and, and they don't have years of experience managing a for-profit or a non-profit. Uh, so it's, it's very much, I think, thinking about whether the intent is aligned with, with uh, our own and then whether we really believe in that team, that management team. So that's, that's really kind of the, out of the gate, the most important uh, points. Um, but then in terms of the financing, I agree with both James and Tom about the type of financing and, and making sure that it's a fit um, because that's, those are, it's, it's like an employee. It's like you're hiring somebody, you're, you're, you're partnering with somebody for, for the, the long term. And so if, if there is a, a disconnect between your values and that, that, that uh, capital provider's values, then there's going to be challenges. And for us, we're, we're one of the few companies that have remained independent in the natural products industry that have gotten to the, the scale. So we're right around 200 million in sales. There aren't many companies that um, stay independent. Um, they're typically acquired or, or, um, or, or IPO or whatever else. And so for, for us, the financing and the philosophy behind the financing was really about uh, providing a flexibility, maximum flexibility for the entrepreneur and, and allowing them to hold on to their businesses or their nonprofits if, if, if that's uh, what their game plan is. And so the, the, the financing has to be sort of non-extractive and that's why it's typically a grant. And then uh, with Intertrack, we did um, this revenue-based financing deal. Um, it's, it's, it's what we call an impact loan. Uh, but it very much uh, allows for uh, the the um, the entrepreneur can can pay back sort of at the same uh, on the same sort of timeline that they are actually uh, generating sales and profits rather than having you know a conventional loan which is a fixed debt service uh, or equity um, which is you know much more cap uh, an expensive form of capital. And, and can lead to the issues down the road. Uh, but in, in, in our case, we have really less of an interest in taking an ownership stake and just making sure that the, the, the venture uh, can, can, um, can do well. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, you know, I, I am, I'm hearing this sort of alignment of interests, alignment of values. Um, Looking, looking towards the community, towards friends and family. Um, at the end of the day, though, you know, um, not everyone can can get that kind of loan. Not everyone's going to to get um, some of the impact investing. Um, for those companies out there that are looking for investment, whether it be the kind of loan that you're talking about, less. Um, what are investors looking for? What motivates them to choose one company over another? Well, let me say one thing, which is let me say one thing, which is I think really important. As I drop the okay, <laughs> um, yeah, the mic thing fell down, but that's good. Um, I think it's really important to realize that in this economy here in Oregon we are likely to have a lot of very, like, very successful small businesses. There, there's, you know, single provider therapists, um, you know, group, um, groups that come together that are, you know, kind of um, guides and therapists. Um, those businesses generally make money from day one. You need to get, you know, a space to do it. You need to get insurance. You need to have billing software. You need to have a couple things together. But those fundamentally are businesses that um, don't take a ton of startup capital. You're not um, f battling the FDA or you're not filing patents. You, you know, 
you can be incredibly successful right out of the box without ever taking money sometimes or bootstrapping it. Um, that's why I think that, I mean, a lot of the people that this is going to positively affect are going to be already doing some kind of therapy that are already going to be um, you know, providing these services outside of the legal framework um, and they're gonna be, have been trained. And so I think for the vast majority of people, venture capital like, is a distraction. Um, I think that, um, so, so let's just say that first. I, th I, think, I think that um, the types of businesses though that I would personally be most interested in here are ones that are largely gonna be in the training space um, two that are going to be coming here, um, having kind of worked on a model from elsewhere and using this as an opportunity to kind of grow and support that um, existing model, whether that be kind of like synthesis in terms of having, you know, retreats and centers and, and largely focusing on kind of a non, um, you know, insurance patient. Um, and then I think, you know, three is if you look at some of the financing, if you can, if there, if there become groups that are here in terms of, um, you know, treatment networks, um, it could be really interesting. Um, that is probably not going to be necessarily an equity investment. That'll likely be a rev share investment. But um, I think, you know, ones that aren't interesting. Um, and I think this was touched on earlier today, but um, having experience from the cannabis world, 280E taxes is something that we're probably just going to start talking about now that in a year when you do this again, will be front and center in the conversation. Because, um, you know, cannabis businesses uh, learn the hard way that it's very, um, it, there's a lot of um, uh, kind of issues around, you know, you're not a profitable company and yet you're still paying taxes. Like, how does that work? Um, 280 is a really difficult, um, you know, kind of impediment and a barrier that basically, you know, was, was kind of pitched as this isn't going to be an issue. We're going to find a way to structure around this. And so what I would say is as much as possible, if you're a business operating here, try to eliminate or try to structure around 280 taxes. And I think that um, that's a safe to say, you know, kind of thing where if that's an issue, um, that will be something that will be a drag on investors investing. Thanks, James. Um, we have two minutes left, but what I wanted to get to, because um, I know that a few of you have talked about the possibility of grants and things like that, where can NASA businesses find a list or find the resources to find where those grants might be available and how they might be able to apply? Anyone else? That's a good <laughs> question. <laughs> I don't have that list. <laughs> Anifa. Great question. From yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to do some research on yeah, that, we'll find that. <laughs> yeah. and we will get back to you. Um, panelists, please stay up here. Thank you so much for your Thank time. You. Um, <laughs>